Good afternoon. You are with the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. Uh, we are gathered this afternoon with Orange County Sheriff Bill Boniak and with Commissioner Mike Sherling um, from Department of Public Safety. Um, and we appreciate you being with us today. Um, the committee is getting up to speed with some new members of the legislature and some folks who are newly transferred to government operations from other committees. Um, and so what we would like to understand, um, and I'm gonna ask you first to, to do a, just a high level introduction to the, the Law Enforcement Advisory Board. Um, and then I would love for us to be able to dive in a little bit on the uh, body worn camera policy uh, process that you are uh, embarking on at, at the moment. So Bill, I assume you're gonna speak to us first and Commissioner Sherling's on backup if we pepper you with too many questions. Absolutely. <laughs> so Madam Chair and uh, representatives, uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm Bill Boniak, Orange County Sheriff, Chair of the LEAB. And the LEAB, the Law Enforcement Advisory Board, uh, just give you a, the higher level of what's, back in 2000, 2004, the Vermont uh, General Assembly created the Law Enforcement Advisory Board. And the, the purpose of the board um, was to advise the Commissioner of Public Safety, the Governor, and the General Assembly of issues that affect all law enforcement in Vermont, i.e. the body-worn cameras, uh, use of force, fair and impartial policing. Um, every year, uh, there may be requests from the, from the governing bodies to look at uh, some of the items. And that's what we do. We have a collaborative approach. Uh, the LAAP is made up of currently uh, 17 members who are a um, put together by our legislators. And it, it's everybody from, you know, from the commissioner to the sheriffs, to the chiefs of police, uh, constable, um, members of, I got a whole list. So I'll just give you an idea from the uh, attorney general's office, uh, fishing game, Vermont leagues and city towns, defender general's office. So we got a, a a wide variety of, uh, of people, you know, with all different levels of um, experience with with law enforcement. With uh, so, and then what we do is uh, we'll we'll look at something like what we're, what we're looking at today, the body worn cameras. And back in back in the fall, we were requested to um, by DPS to update the body worn cameras. And uh, so on December 21st, we got the first draft at our regular meeting. And then we, what we did is we formed a subcommittee of, of uh, three members. They took that and worked with um, uh, Jen Morrison. She's a special, uh, special assistant to the, to the commissioner's office, to the commissioner. And uh, they reviewed it. They looked at many different policies out there. Um, they also worked with uh, the ACLU and I believe a total of over 140 different, uh, let's say recommendations that came in. So a lot of people have, have got eyes on this and it's uh, very transparent. So uh, we just met this past Monday and we reviewed it and we had a couple more minor changes that we'd like to see. So we're sending it back to the subcommittee for their review to make uh, some minor changes. And then it'll come back to our February meeting, we'll review it. So either f our February meeting or the latest, it'll be March that hopefully the LEOB, LEAB will approve it and then move it forward uh, to the Vermont Criminal uh, Justice Council. And then, but I just wanna bring it so you know that once the LEA Bay approves this, uh, this policy, this model policy, that'll become the standard until 
the Vermont Criminal Justice Training, or the training out of it, the council, they'll, they'll take it, review it, make any changes, and they have until January 1st, 2022, to bring it back before the legislators. Um, so that's where we're at right now. And uh, myself and the commissioner, we're, we're both here to answer any questions. So I appreciate the overview of the process. Um, and I guess what I'd like to do is drill down a little bit into some of the considerations, some of the actual policy considerations themselves, just so that members of the committee can get a, a sense of, um, you know, what are you going for? What are you aiming at? What are the what are the problem areas that are uh, that are sticking points for you? Um, what can you tell us about what, what you expect will be ultimately contained there? All right. Um, some of the, I'd say, if you want to, the biggest areas of some controversial areas, um, it's going to be, you know, um, can an officer review the recordings prior to giving statements on a potential criminal investigation? So that's, that's one of them. Um, retention guidelines, timelines. Um, most particularly with lethal force incidents, uh, but in general, you know, everything. Um, the prohibitions of the use of body-worn cameras in schools or hospitals uh, to work through to allow for recordings if the officer responds to an incident where a use of force uh, is likely or during a criminal investigation on site. Uh, the, other, the other thing that's gonna be difficult and very expensive is the redaction. Uh, you know, when you're talking about uh, on a statewide level, uh, I'm sure the commissioner will talk about this because we've been kicking around ideas, uh, you know, currently, um, there's many police departments and sheriff's departments who do have body worn cameras and we're currently, some people are using the cloud for storage. Some are doing, um, like I'll give you an example for sheriff's department. Um, we're keeping, we have a separate computer and a separate hard drive, uh, like a three or four terabyte hard drive that we store all the data on for one year. And then we, we just buy a new, new hard drive and start all over again every year. Uh, the bigger picture, if we go statewide, if the, if the state is gonna, um, I don't wanna take too much away from the commissioner, but you know, we're, we're looking at a new ma uh, records management system that's gonna go statewide. You know, will everything be stored on there for all of the videos? Uh, it's, there's a lot of questions um, any, let me stop there and ask any, you know, if you have questions or commissioner. I'm, uh, Claire has a question. Yes, Samantha. Rob, Rob, unmute yourself. Sorry, you couldn't understand when my lips were moving. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I don't know if this is a question for the sheriff or the commissioner, but when we're, we're talking about uh, body camera policy here, we already have a fairly extensive and robust one for VSP, don't we? We do, and, and we have a, that's a good question. Um, and we have a, a robust statewide model that was previously developed. However, as uh, we learn more, as the community standards change, um, and uh, as a, a number of other things intersect uh, body-worn cameras, uh, evolution of use of force in response to resistance and, and a host of other topics, uh, this is a timely uh, point to uh, make modifications and to take additional stakeholder feedback. Um, as you'll see in the, the memorandum that we drafted, there's been extensive stakeholder feedback 
And the areas that the sheriff uh, has outlined, um, you know, when to turn the camera on and off, uh, retention schedules, what types of things need to be redacted, uh, and review of footage by officers and when that should occur um, are, all, are the key areas where we've sought feedback. Uh, we've engaged um, professionals that um, can help us understand uh, things like memory and uh, how review of body-worn camera footage can impact memory. Uh, and we're weaving all of those things together to create an update from that solid foundation uh, that existed previously. But we, we do believe this will be a, a substantial uh, set of enhancements. And, and I'm happy to go into more detail around those uh, policy considerations that the sheriff sure, was sure. outlining, if you'd like. Well, thank you, Commissioner. I And I, you know, if we can wait for another day, if it's appropriate, that's fine. I'm just curious. I recognize that this is one of those things that has to change as society changes to a certain degree. But um, for lack of a better expression, it, it, there's a part of it. Sometimes it feels like we're just trying to reinvent the wheel. It would seem like several of those examples that you pointed out, um, I would have thought we would have already, in some cases, have addressed them. Some of them were addressed, uh, but the, the thinking uh, evolves over time, and we are constantly looking for uh, ways to improve policy and operations, uh, notwithstanding legislative uh, action or interest. Uh, this happens with dozens of policies on an annual basis. Uh, we're working on a couple right now uh, in the wake of some uh, a couple of events that we're, we're learning how to better handle certain kinds of things, and we're making policy alterations um, you know, today over the next uh, week or so on a couple of other areas of operation. So it's a normal course of business. Very good. Thank you, sir. You know, one of the things that um, you know, we're adding some definitions to the policy and you know, we, the ACLU has made many recommendations and uh, we have incorporated those into the policy. So, you know, we're, we're making sure we're being, you know, fair to all parties concerned, everyone, you know, and even with, um, you know, we're addressing the, the prohibition of the use of facial recognition. So the only time that that can be used, you, you're going to need a search warrant. So uh, there's, there's a lot to this. It's not, you know, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. We're just, as the commissioner said, we're adding to it and uh, we're making it more um, of today's recent standards that have been going on on a nationwide level. You know, we're, I think we're getting ahead of the curve here in Vermont. So it, it may make sense to elaborate just a, a little bit on a couple of those areas where the policy considerations have been um, most robustly discussed and, and, uh, and additional language um, added. Uh, among them, when the camera should be on or off. You know, when you look at this from the outside, um, the initial reaction is, well, why would you ever shut it off? Well, if we're in a public restroom and we're not dealing with a violent event or something that needs to be captured, uh, people have a privacy interest there. When we're in a school or a hospital, um, there are privacy interests that override uh, the need to, to capture uh, encounters with, uh, with officers. And of course, if things go uh, poorly uh, when we turn them on at that point. Relative to retention, uh, you're balancing um, the technology and, and how much storage, the, the sheer volume uh, with the need to retain footage. And it's important to note when you talk about retention, there are two different kinds of retention. First is the initial retention period where all video is stored for a period of time while you can assess whether it needs to be archived. And that's that second level. Anything that involves an arrest, uh, involves a use of force or an unusual event, or it's capturing evidence or something of that nature, it's gonna be archived and, and basically held forever. Um, but for all the other encounters, the day-to-day -day things that are happening where it's just ca it, it's capturing interactions, um, those are typically gonna be held for 90 days well. Um, there are, you can make assessments as to whether there's something that needs to be archived uh, for a longer period of time. And then uh, redaction is a whole area where, um, you know, the technology and, and, and uh, processing things and, and altering video is, uh, is a little bit dicey, um, but it's something that we're working through. And I don't want to 
bring us down that rabbit hole too far um, in this initial overview. Uh, the last piece is uh, when an officer should review footage. Nine times out of 10, uh, an officer's actions don't result in any kind of uh, serious outcome. Uh, someone's not injured. It's not a use of force where lethal force is used. To, superstition, knock on wood. If I say that, something bad could happen. Um, most uh, of the footage is just of routine things and it's used to refresh an officer's memory as a, a report is written or, or something of that nature. And there are no restrictions uh, in the draft policy relative to reviewing footage on sort of the day-to-day -day things that just happen. There are restrictions or, or parameters uh, in the draft uh, that are informed by memory science and uh, the need to conduct an independent parallel investigation in incidents where there's death or serious bodily injury, where a lethal force has been used, where the officer for a period of time becomes the subject of a parallel uh, ongoing uh, criminal investigation. And the best science we've been able to, uh, to, to unearth and the best guidance that we've been able to draft so far, and this is still in development, uh, creates a balance where uh, an officer will uh, write their report or give uh, an interview without the benefit of their memory being aided by the video, understanding that memory is fallible uh, and that certain periods of time have to elapse before a memory actually sets in. There's a chemistry behind that. And then Following that, the, uh, the officer can review the footage and then make alterations or, um, or clearly document what, was, uh, what facts were enhanced without uh, modifying their original um, statement. So that's the balance that uh, appears to be the best um, policy construct based on the current thinking around the use of video in those kinds of serious incidents. Thanks, Commissioner. I've got Sam Lefebvre with a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, um, Chair and Commissioner. So my questions um, kind of hit a couple different spots. So the cameras that are already in use, how would those be used more if, let's say, like DMV does get them? Because what their work is, is completely different in a sense, like, you know, they're creeping under tractor trailers, would those hold up or would be looking at different systems? And a couple, you know, I'm grateful to have many friends that are in law enforcement and they consistently remind me that a camera is only good for proof if it, or, you know, for proof for either person, you know, the officer or the um, civilian, if it's there. And so, you know, God forbid there is a horrible incident and some, the camera gets taken off the officer. And if, I don't think the state's in a situation to pay for the automatic upload of the recording. Have we thought about that also? Uh, I'm not sure I'm following the second question, but let me do the first one first. Uh, the camera systems are uh, hardened systems. They're, they're designed for use in all kinds of conditions, rain, sleet, snow, extreme temperatures uh, of, of all types. Um, underneath trucks, you wouldn't necessarily have to have the camera on uh, by policy because it's designed to record, or the policy is designed to um, direct the recording of interactions between um, an officer and the public. That's not to say it couldn't be used to document defective equipment or something that was found uh, underneath uh, a tractor trailer, but that's not the primary uh, use. And I'm sorry, I, I, if the sheriff followed the second question, I'll have him answer, but if not, I may have to ask you to, to rephrase it for me. If so, Sam, if you could just rephrase that, please. So if you have an officer who's having a public interaction and the interaction goes south and the officer is injured and the camera is taken off of the officer, is there any way for you guys to track the camera or pull that information off if you don't have the camera? No, that's a great question. Uh, if the hardware is lost, the video is lost as well until that video is either, uh, until the, the camera, the hardware itself is either docked for upload or in some instances we have the ability to wirelessly upload 
um, from a barracks or a police station or a, a wireless access point. That's because correct. We're not, we're, not at the, we're not at the point yet where th there may come a future time when it's streaming from the scene to another location, but that technology is not available yet. And I don't believe the funds are either from just other departments perspective, the amount of funds it would take to automatically upload to a cloud is something the state of Vermont would not be that happy looking at the price tag for. Um, so those are just points I'd like to just look at, um, you know, and the couple of DMV officers I've talked to, they mentioned the same thing that when they were you know, on their creeper, they wouldn't be necessarily recording, but if they popped up and the trucker was unhappy with them and that moment of them setting up, they were caught in a scenario, it might be good to have that on camera, but then it goes into when to turn it off, when to turn it on and discretion. So um, thank you guys for your questions, or your answers and your time. Thank you. Yes, if I may just add, a, a camera is a tool. It is not a perfect tool. Um, it doesn't, um, it, it does require that you push buttons. You don't always know when you're going to need to push those buttons. The buttons don't always work. And candidly, in under stressful situations, your fingers don't always work. So uh, it's not perfect. There are going to be instances when a camera should have been on when it's not. It, it's, it's going to happen. Uh, and the, the, the goal is for those things to happen as infrequently as possible and to strive for perfection uh, as much as we can, but we'll not hit that mark every time. The other thing too, um, most of these cameras, they're, they're set up, they're either, re they're recording all the time, but when you hit that button record, it goes back either 30 seconds or a minute. It depends on what the camera is set up for. So like you said, if, you, if a DMV inspector's underneath the truck and the guy starts kicking him, he slides out and that is recorded. And then when he hits record button, it goes back that 30 seconds or 60 seconds. So uh, like commissioner said, these are tools, they're not perfect, but, and there's uh, several different camera styles out there. Everything from eyeglasses to um, worrying on your shoulder, worrying it directly on your chest. So, um, you know, and the technology is ever changing. Um, we had some of our digital cameras in our cars. Well, as soon as they, as soon as we pulled into our, into the sheriff's office and you're in reach of the Wi-Fi, it automatically down, downloaded. You didn't have to um, uh, manually, you know, download the camera footage it would automatically do it as soon as you come in contact with the Wi-Fi. So, you know, the technology is out there and it's ever changing. All right, John uh, Gannon. John, you uh, you need to unmute. Thank I think you. You, were, you were unmuted before you just remuted yourself. <laughs> I hate it when that happens. <laughs> Thank you very much for testifying today, Sheriff and Commissioner. Um, I have a comment and then a question. Um, I just want to remind you about Act 106's prohibition on the use of facial recognition, except by drones. Um, so you just want to maybe take that into consideration in your policy, because even warranted facial recognition would be prohibited by Act 106. Um, so uh, my question deals with um, what recommendations of the ACLU um, you did not incorporate. I believe... Um... Correct me if I'm wrong, Commissioner, but I believe um, we incorporated all of them. Um, I think it's pretty close. Uh, I think there's a couple of fragments that may be different. I think in, on retention, uh, we may be different by uh, uh, an incremental factor. I don't recall exactly what it is. I don't have that spreadsheet uh, of all of the feedback and what's been incorporated. Uh, what's been partially incorporated and what hasn't been incorporated in front of me right now. Can we have that, please? Sure, we'll get it to you. Thank you. I think that was uh, attached to a document that was sent to you, but I have to verify that. It may be the use of force one that's complete and that one's been submitted. We have uh, 
an unbelievable amount of work that's in progress. So um, a spreadsheet was sent yesterday. It might be the use of horse version. The one no that worries. A, we'll be patient. I just want to, you know, reassure the committee here that, you know, this has been thoughtfully uh, looked at and, you know, transparency, um, you know, working with all groups, everyone listening, like I said, from the beginning, I think over, there was a, like, I believe like a hundred, over 140 inputs on this, people adding stuff or making recommendations. So, you know, we're being mindful to everyone, well, you know, everyone involved. And uh, we just want to make sure we are doing the right thing and we get this policy done, you know, correctly. And uh, that all, all Vermonters feel, um, you know, law enforcement, we're, we're on the right track. We're doing the right thing here. And to uh, answer your question on the spreadsheet, it was use of force that was submitted and the body worn camera version of that uh, is not complete yet, but it will be um, available once it is complete. Um, but if you wanna know what it will look like, you can take a look at the use of force version of that. Hal Colston. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good to see you again, Commissioner, and nice to meet you, Sheriff. Um, could you speak to your process for soliciting feedback and input from Vermonters with um, lived experiences with um, body-worn cameras, whether it was good, bad, or ugly. What was your process to get those voices? Well, uh, candidly, we don't have a way to identify folks that have lived experience with a body-worn camera, so there isn't a way to directly access that cross-section of, uh, of people. Um, but the, uh, the overall engagement process included um, sending out press releases uh, and inviting uh, stakeholder feedback across social media platforms uh, statewide and directly soliciting feedback from 145 known stakeholders and stakeholder groups. So it was a wide net versus a, well, I guess partially surgical net because the known stakeholders and stakeholder groups received it directly but we don't actually have a mechanism for uh, for reaching folks that um, have lived experience with body worn cameras. I, I've actually never heard uh, that uh, th that population identified that way before. I've heard other populations with lived experience identified, but not not relative to folks that have experience with body worn cameras. I guess I was wondering if there are community-based organizations out there who would be closer to the ground and in touch with people who may have had positive or negative experiences. So that's what I was curious to know. You know, we, no. we went through a similar process with um, our effort to gather input around social equity issues. And we, we really made an effort to find those organizations that are on the ground that would be able to identify people who have had experiences, whether they were positive or negative. So that's what I was curious for. Yeah, so good question. Um, I, I'm not aware of any organization that's organized around folks with that particular kind of experience. Um, but I would also, I guess I would start by referring you to that, that same report I just mentioned, the one that's already been submitted on the use of force policy that has a lengthy list of the stakeholders who provided feedback and those who were engaged. And it's roughly the same list because there's, there's only a finite number of stakeholders in social justice and law enforcement matters in Vermont. So uh, I would expect that once this report's completed, it'll have a similar list attached to it. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from committee members? Right. Um, Commissioner or Sheriff, anything else you would like to share with us? That we're, uh, we'll continue to work on this and hopefully, um, like I said, either our February meeting or by March, uh, we should be, hopefully um, the LEB will be approving it and sending it on to the Vermont Criminal Justice Council. 
Great. And then we'll be working on the next one. <laughs> Well, I appreciate your good work um, and your diligent efforts on this. It's all, um, you know, these are these are tasks that we have um, been called on by our constituents to, um, to to give to someone. So I appreciate that you're focused on that and um, and putting putting your good efforts into it. Oh, you're quite welcome, and I just want to. Uh, give kudos out to our special assistant to to the commissioner uh, Jennifer Morrison. Many of you know her um, from Burlington, and uh, she put a lot of time and effort and research into this. So uh, she is she deserves a lot of credit. It's not as simple as it as someone might seem looking at it from the outside. So I can appreciate that that you have benefited from her research and hard work. Any other questions from committee members before we let the commissioner and the sheriff go? All right, gentlemen, thank you for being with us today. You're quite welcome. Nice to meet everyone. Thank you. All right, committee, um, thank you so much for popping right over here after the floor. Um, the budget adjustment debate went a little faster than I thought it might. So, um, so it looks like we're, we're getting into committee and getting done um, in good time. I don't know about you, but the break we had earlier did not give me enough time to get through all of the <laughs> messages that I needed to respond to and all the phone calls I needed to make, so. Um, so yes, tomorrow we are, let's see, what do we have? We have committee tomorrow after the floor. Um, Carrie Brown will be with us tomorrow morning after the floor to uh, jump back to the boards and commissions bill. And she is uh, gonna come in and talk with us about the Vermont Commission on Women. And then through the first couple of days of next week, we will hear from other uh, boards or folks who are aware of the workings of boards that the bill proposes to change and we'll uh, we'll try to get that bill out in short order next week. So tomorrow afternoon, um, we have a joint uh, hearing with the Commerce and Economic Development Committee. This is, uh, you came as a result of requests by you uh, that we look into um, look into the operations of our UI system and, and uh, try to understand some of the challenges that, that it faced in the unprecedented um, wave of unemployed Vermonters when we shut down after the governor's stay home, stay safe order last March. Um, and so I would expect it will be a good robust discussion and we will benefit from the uh, from the experience and the wisdom of the Commerce Committee folks who we are uh, doing this, this hearing with. And so I guess I would just say that we this will be the first opportunity that we've had to have a, uh, a larger, really large group um, uh, meeting. And so please feel free to raise your hand and, uh, and ask a question as you would. Um, it's a larger group, so it might it might mean that we're moving a little more slowly, but this is important information that we all need to be able to get on behalf of our constituents. And so I, I just want to say right there that, you know, that I want you to feel free to, to get your question in. And if we run out of time, we'll come back to it on another day. Um, and that's all I have. Any questions, committee discussion? Everybody want to go finish sorting through all of the endless communications that they haven't been able to keep up with. <laughs>